Thank you, Ms. Khan. Our teacher in charge, Dr. Aparna Nautiyar, would not be able to join us today as her son has been admitted to the hospital yesterday due to ill health. Though Dr. Aparna could not join us today, but she has conveyed her regards to the speaker and has conveyed her best wishes for the successful conduction of the event. Due to his prior commitments, our principal, sir, Professor Rajiv Agrawal, will not be able to join us. He has conveyed his best wishes for the event, so has been a constant source of motivation and encouragement for all of us, and his blessings and good wishes always motivate us to do our best. I would now request our Honorable Vice Principal, Sir, Professor Kamal Kumar Gupta, to address the audience. Over to you, Sir. Good afternoon. Is that I'm audible? Yes, Sir. Okay. Thank you, Preeti for inviting me to welcome. I am Kamal Kumar Gupta on behalf of Deshpandu College and my own behalf, welcome today's speaker, Dr. Krishna Re, Associate Professor in University of West Bengal, State University of Bengal. Students, you are lucky that you are getting an opportunity to visit Sundarban at such an age. Let me confess one thing. I got for the first time an opportunity. Of course, Sundarban I have not visited yet. But for the first time, I could see the mangroves uh, last couple of years, uh, maybe in 2010 or 12, when I visited Andaman Nicobar. Whenever we talk about the Sundarban, whenever immediately the things try to mind is the mangroves. And Sundarban, you all may be knowing, then very much name of this came from the tree Sundari, if I'm not wrong. I, please correct me because I'm not a person of botany, but uh, as I heard that there's a dominant flora of Sundari tree, which give the name Sundarban. Sundari, Sundarban, ban is forest. So forest of Sundari. Mangroves are some of the most fascinating aspects. Uh, of course, rather what I say, what human being can do, watch the nature, admire and appreciate. That is the only thing we can do. How nature has given such a diverse flora and fauna and everywhere and how much it is important. That is probably beyond our imaginations. Whenever we talk about the mangroves, I think the very first thing which came to our mind is even in school time, nematophores, the respiratory roots. I also used to relate the mangroves with the respiratory roots. But of course, mangroves are some of the finest tree, some of the most interesting tree, because they are so tolerant. They live in intertidal regions. Not only this, they live in two hostile conditions. At one time, they have a harsh pressure of salt, seawater, and other side, 
the fresh water is coming. So two extreme conditions and they survive. So their physiology is absolutely fantastic. But at the same time, it is not only the physiology, they are our coast guard. They really guard our coast. They prevent the erosion of the coastline. I, I, I know here in this team, Dr. Saurabh would also be there who has done extensively on the mangroves. So it's so fascinating. Uh, we say that mangroves are marginal, but they are unique. They are productive, they're dynamic. They support a large fauna, fish in the form of fishes, invertebrates, birds. So they form absolutely a unique, productive, important from human point of view. I know that this visit, this excursion is certainly going to be most fascinating. And uh, without uh, taking much of the time, I again welcome all the uh, participants, all the faculty members, students, and uh, faculty from other colleges, faculty from our own college, Everyone is welcome in this fascinating, interesting event. And I again welcome Dr. Krishna Ray for her very, very interesting and fascinating uh, this story, what, what a visit she is going to take us. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for taking out time from your busy schedule to address the audience. Sir, I must say that your enthusiasm is contagious and your cheerful and positive attitude inspires all of us to work hard towards the betterment of the college. Thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you, sir. I would now request uh, Ms. Tanya Saxena to introduce our invited speaker for today, today's event. Over to, over to you, Tanya. Thank you, ma'am. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Krishna Ray. She did her undergraduate and postgraduate studies in botany from University of Calcutta with specialization in plant physiology and biochemistry. She did her PhD in science, botany from University of Calcutta with a thesis focusing on development of transgenic cotton cotton plant expressing bacillus thuringiensis endotoxin gene. She started her career as JRF and SRF at Bose Institute, Kolkata, and IIT BRDF Biotech, Kharagpur during her PhD thesis in 1993. She later worked as DBT postdoctoral fellow at Bose Institute, Kolkata from 1999 till 2001. From 2001 till 2009, she worked as a research associate in various projects at the Department of Genetics, Delhi University South Campus. In 2009, she served as research scientist in DB Center of Excellence Project at the Department of Genetics, Delhi University South Campus. Since 2009, she has been serving as assistant professor at Department of Botany, West Bengal State University, Kolkata. One of the major achievements of her illustrious career include restoration of degraded mangrove ecosystem in Indian Sundarbans in West Bengal in collaboration with Department of Forest, Government of West Bengal. Since 2020, around 60 hectares of degraded mangroves have been targeted and ecologically restored. This project has been funded by Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Her groundbreaking work has been published in numerous newspaper articles and is widely known. Recently, she was part of a field-based workshop organized by West Bengal State University in collaboration with Newcastle University, UK, on the theme, Building Ecological Resilience in Vulnerable Mangroves of the Indian Sundarbans, Sustainable and Equitable Management of Biodiversity and ecosystem services in the era of climate change. With a career spanning three decades, she has been involved in various research projects, publications, and conferences. She has been part of five research projects and is currently working on one as well. She also has several research publications under her name. Besides this, 
Dr. Ray has delivered invited lectures in numerous workshops, webinars, and conferences, both national and international. Under her supervision, four students have been awarded a PhD till date. Now, I would like to request our invited speaker for the day, Dr. Krishna Ray, to please take over the session. And I would, uh, I would also like to request the participants to please post their queries in the chat box, which will be taken up at the end. Should I start now? Yes, Krishna, ma'am, please. Okay, I'm just sharing my screen and then I'll start. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am, we can see the slides. Okay. Uh, I first thank uh, my uh, extreme, I first I express actually my extreme gratitude to the organizers of Deshbandhu College, University of Delhi. I, I actually feel honored to be here uh, to make this visit to Sundarbans, this virtual tour. Uh, this, you know, this lecture was uh, actually earlier, it was uh, scheduled to be on 16th, but I must thank the organizer that due to my personal problem, I couldn't be there on 16th and they patiently waited for this. And again, it, they uh, allowed me uh, to present it here today. So I'm really thankful to all the organizers that they have again readjusted the time for me. Uh, so I don't have my words to express my gratitude to them. And I must thank the principal, vice principal, the TIC, the convener of the uh, program, Preeti. Preeti is actually my colleague. He, she was my colleague in uh, Delhi University when we were there. And uh, DBT Star College coordinator and IQAC coordinator, all of you, I, I must first express my gratitude to give me this opportunity to present this tour. So without uh, talking much i directly go to the students students uh, this tour will be really totally pictorial and based on videography all the videographies are funded by government of india department of biotechnology actually whatever i'll show you everything you know that these things this needs a lot of travel and everything so these are all funded by our department of biotechnology government of india and I'll be whatever I'll be showing, I'll show on behalf of DBT only. And please uh, allow me to show it. Uh, okay. And uh, you know, today I am not going to any of the theories. Uh, whatever I'll tell you, I'll tell you through the pictures and videos only. There is no theory. There are no theories. No. Uh, don't think about the textbook uh, knowledge. Is nothing you will be needing. So just feel free as if you are in Sundarbans and <laughs> you are visiting Sundarbans. Okay, okay, I'm going to the next slide. Uh, you know this Sundarbans is not only, it's confined to Indian part. It is actually a contiguous stretch, it's stretched between Bangladesh and India. And our Indian part, it got uh, very recently, it got recognized as Ramsar site. You know Ramsar site means it's a, uh, it's, uh, a uh, very important wetland site. Okay, now it's recognized this Indian part. And UNESCO already announced this Indian Sundarbans at World, as its World Heritage Site. And uh, already, whatever I had to say, whatever theories I had to say, these have already been covered by Dr. Gupta. He, he has very <laughs> excellently, he has. Uh, Give you, gave, he has already given you the basics of mangroves and Sundarbans. So I don't need to <laughs> continue, don't need to repeat it again. So you see, this is the plant. This is the plant Sundari, which we call uh, this heritage of homies, actually. And this is, at present, it is globally, it is endangered. And in Indian part of Sundarbans, it is actually critically endangered. Okay. And... Uh, 
as professor gupta said that it is it was it had been once upon a time it was the dominant flora of indian sundarbans but now if you go to indian sundarbans hardly you can find them hardly so therefore i couldn't show you any videography of <laughs> sundari trees it's actually it's uh, it's flooding is also very very erratic and it's very this phenology it has totally changed due to climate change and uh, in very few natural populations you can find these sundari plants and uh, collection of propagules from sundari plants is also very very difficult for us okay and this is the location of indian sundarbans you see thus uh, basically this is the bangladesh part okay this is this line is dividing bangladesh sundarbans and this is the indian part okay and the green areas green areas are all protected areas you all know about the uh, biosphere reserve so this is the sundarban biosphere reserve in under indian part and you know this is a protected region but uh, this is uh, here the restrictions are less but among in this protected region there is a certain part which is actually the tiger reserve this is the tiger reserve okay and uh, this is the sanctuary part and this is the core area so here nobody is allowed to enter only in the fringe areas uh, the tourists are allowed but nobody is allowed to enter and not even i am allowed to work there also only in the fringe areas i can get the access of the fringe areas only not in other areas so i mostly confine myself within this area this is the settlement region of sundarbans and the fringe area the buffer areas so here i uh, i have all the access to the mangroves and all the settlement regions on the settlement fringes along these rivers along these creeks here i can move freely so these areas i have been permitted only so this area is totally out of my bounds and everybody's bounds uh, this is actually uh, controlled by forest department totally so i don't need to work also there i am mainly concerned about the settlement regions the buffer areas okay so you can see these are the points these are the camp areas these are the camp areas which is maintained by a forest department okay whenever you go the tourists go they will be taken to these camps only you can go to these camps these camps are you can visit the camps you can go there you can get down okay and your boat has to get permits and you can go there and there are several big rivers in sundarbans you see this is the saptamukhi river okay this is the thakuran river this is the matla river okay and across on the extreme uh, extreme west you can find this muri ganga this is muri ganga this is saptamukhi this is thakuran this is matla these are the four big rivers which are actually traversing and their tributaries are traversing throughout this region mostly the western part of indian sundarbans and where i work i work basically in this area this is the pathar pratima block and here this is a small village called ramganga this is the center of our work and from there we work in this pathar pratima this district and my student have made one map he has spotted the sites where we work this is the ramganga this is the site where we have been working since the late 2013 and these are the uh, nearby pristine forests dashpur bhagwatpur lothian dhonchi um, then there is uh, prentis all these areas so these areas i keep frequenting between these areas because here i have the access i don't have much access here so i uh, have uh, not visited the eastern part also too much so i i uh, so far i have been i have Uh, restricted myself only this part, but when I know ins and outs of these parts, so whatever I'm going to show you mainly from this region. So this is the location. Okay. Now I told you that the forest campsites in for, at forest campsites you will be allowed to get down. So I'm showing you some of the forest campsites where we were allowed to take the pictures. Not all the campsites we are not allowed to take the picture. This is the Google uh, image. This is Google Earth image. This is Bonny Camp. Okay, this is the Bonny Camp. You can see the, there are two big reservoirs in Bonny Camp, and you will be surprised to know that the 
salinity of this reservoir is very low. It is just 1.8 decicm per meter, whereas just outside, just outside this dam, this river, it is having the salinity. Uh, this is a very recent uh, observation, so it's around 20. So uh, it's around 20, and uh, uh, with monsoon, it's supposed to get down. But usually it remains, it fluctuates between 20 to 30 always. But how <laughs> in this uh, highly hypersaline region, the, such a sweet water pond is big, being maintained, that is the technology which is with our forest department. So they have, a, actually they do it by rainwater harvesting. So the rainwater is her, which is harvested here, it has a very low salinity. And with the help of this low salinity water, what they have done, they have uh, these are the they have uh, made excellent growth of some uh, mangrove species which love the which actually love the low salinity water. They actually the, we call them the freshwater loving mangroves. So you can see these are the mangrove ferns, Acrostichum. Okay, this is the mangrove ferns. They have grown this Acrostichum on just lining their sweet water pond. And these are the Sundari trees. In this Boni camp, if you go there, you can see a large number of Sundari trees which have been planted by the forest department. And uh, they must have now come into the flower. Boni camp is too far away from where we work. And at this time of the year, you cannot go there because you know this time the sea, the rivers will be too much turbulent. So we dare to move out at this time. So, but at this time only it come, it, it's supposed to come into flower. So it's uh, difficult to get the picture from there. All the time we cannot go so far. So these are the Sundari populations which have been developed by a forest department at the Boni camp site. This is another camp. This is Dubanki camp. It is near the tiger reserve. Here everyone is allowed. Here also you can see they have uh, maintained, they have uh, made a reservoir there. And this is the pond. Here also you can see this salinity of this pond is very low. It's just 1.9. But outside it, in the river, the salinity is very high, 35 decimal. So this is a, an a excellent example of rainwater harvesting. They, they have done it by only rainwater harvesting and this sweet water is used for everything. What, uh, the uh, watering of the plants, the freshwater mangroves, which are growing here and the forest people, forest staff who are staying there, they use this water. So this is fresh water, but outside, this area, the water is hypersaline. So it's another enigma of <laughs> nature. This is the Dubanki cap, you see. And this is another Lothian eco cap. Here also the same thing. They have a reservoir here and around this they have maintained, they made, this is the thing. Here also you find this, this is slightly, it's saline, but it's, uh, it is, uh, I think it was taken in December or something, I think the salinity was recorded. So it's 3.6 and outside uh, the, the river, which is uh, outside this area, just in front of this area, the salinity is around 32. So you can imagine, but here also they have developed a very wonderful, population of Sundari plants. Here also you can see. Okay, so these Sundari plants are now basically they exist in our forest camp offices and very hardly we can find natural populations. We are working on it, but still these are the Sundari populations, the Heritier of homies. Okay, so whatever I'll be showing you uh, mainly the assemblage of true mangrove species and mangrove associates. You know that mangroves have typical uh, adaptive characters, which we can see. We know the sir has already told you about the pneumatophores, and you know our typical uh, germination uh, uh, trait in mangroves, that's the viviparous germination. When uh, they are already inside the fruit, they will start, the radical will come out. So with the fruit and the radical, we call it a complete propagin. So we can see it, uh, most of the rhizophoraceae plants and most of the crypto viviparous plants, you can see this intact propagules, how it's coming out from the fruit itself. So these are the true mangrove characters, but mangrove associates the plants which 
this uh, they belonging to not rhizophoraceae or other mangrove uh, the familiar mangrove families they are common like leguminosae malvaceae uh, sterculaceae from this uh, family they are belonging to these families but some of the members of these families they have also evolved with this mangrove species they don't have the true mangrove character but still they are surviving at this extremely harsh weather so that is also very interesting and i'll show you some of the mangrove invertebrate uh, the pictures and videos of some mangrove invertebrates these are the marine faunas and uh, among the vertebrate species we can see the fish species also here and dolphins crocodiles birds and of course royal bengal tiger but <laughs> I cannot show you the Royal Bengal Tiger because I have never visited any Royal Bengal Tiger. I have never come across so far because I don't work in the tiger zone also. But we have been, uh, we just, you know, this this year several uh, tiger, there were several human tiger con conflicts. Some of the tigers, they came out of the national park area and they uh, invaded the settlement area. So there was a huge uh, responsibility of forest department to catch them back safe and return them to the again to their natural habitat so that was the stories with forest department i don't have those stories um, but we have been lucky to see the pug mark so one of my students he has taken the picture of the pug mark because at that time we were running one workshop there uh, in uh, this eastern part of Sundarbans, just in front of the National Park area, Tiger Reserve area. So we have, we were uh, blessed to see just a pug mark, nothing else. Okay, that I'll show you. And uh, we know that Sundarbans is the, it's well known for its honey. So I'll show the main plant, which is responsible for this production of this honey and the uh, pollinator and the livelihood of Sundamas and some glimpses of our work, what we are doing there, okay? So now start a visit to Sundamans. So, this is a drone image. It's very slow. Okay. You can see it, it's, it's visible. Yes, ma'am, we can see. Okay, it's a dr drone image. You see how the Sundarban mangroves are arranged. This is the fringe area mangroves. And you see just, this is the river. And just uh, behind these mangroves, you can see these are the settlement areas. So how the mangroves are protecting our settlement areas. These are the fringe regions. And how mangroves are actually protecting our Can you see this one here? It's much more visible. You see, these are the mangrove fringes. And just behind this, these are the settlement areas. These are all our cultivated fields, the villages, everything. So if we destroy these mangroves, then what will happen? The cyclones, they will directly enter into our cultivated fields. And there will be extreme during cyclone, there are uh, very high surges of water, hypersaline water, and that will enter into these cultivated areas, cultivated lands, and it will destroy all our crops. So without, as Sir already told you, these are actually our coastal guards. So they actually keep us safe, and they not only keep the safe, the adjacent, uh, this land, the settlement areas, they also, they are responsible for they are also responsible for uh, saving the city Calcutta. Otherwise, Calcutta would not have been at Calcutta's place so far. The way we have been facing the cyclones repeatedly within a very short interval and IPCC's sixth assessment report, they have predicted more and more cyclones to come in the coming years. So with that, the mangroves have a very uh, great responsibility to save our cities from uh, these cyclones actually. 
without these mangroves we will be totally destroyed this total this uh, the uh, what i say the wind speed wind speed would have been so high so high so high it would destroy it would devastated it would have devastated our city of calcutta so we are <laughs> we are really grateful to the mangrove species how they are uh, saving our life and this is a top view you see this is a pristine mangrove this is the image from a drone you see this is a pristine mangrove pristine mangrove means undisturbed mangrove forest this here the human being has not yet been able to destroy it yet so it's still uh, it's flourishing so this is the top view from a drone image i'm just fast forwarding it it's showing the same thing okay now it's a closer view of the mangrove species you can see different heterogeneous mangrove populations are here this is not a monotypic forest you can see the diversity you can see the diversity of mangroves here you can see the steel roots of mangroves these are all drone images i'll show you the closer images also now you see what is this species you can see this is rhizophora it's most probably rhizophora epiculata because uh, mucronata is there in indian sudabans and you see the kind of spectacular steel roots they have it's very strong it's very strong and it helps the plant to be anchored to the uh, to its substratum and it helps it to survive all the it has it it uh, ensures it mechanical strength to survive all the cyclonic surges everything so you can see when we travel through the boat this is the thing we observe actually now i am taking you to the inside of the creeks and other things you can see so just imagine you are in a boat and you are moving through a creek so on both the sides you can see the mangrove species they are different different species here you can see the mangrove dead palm this is the mangrove dead palm this compound leaves with this you can see the exicaria agalocha and there are several other species also these are mangrove dead palms the compound leaves so when we move through the boat uh, these are the this is how it looks actually and it's very difficult to get into the uh, dense mangrove forest it's very difficult and uh, the weather right now we can imagine how much high the temperature is there and along with high humidity it's really uh, very difficult to work in mangrove environment in throughout the seasons it's very difficult only in uh, winter we have some relief but otherwise it's very difficult for us to work here you can see some natural background music see imagine you are in the creek and you are moving so this is how it looks uh these all videographies and the pictures they have been done by only my phd students so we are not professional photographers so please excuse us
this is again another view from the boat. You can see the seedlings here. The in after each monsoon, the new seedlings come up when the mud flat is undisturbed. You can see here the smaller. This is a smaller tire. Here, these new seedlings, new uh, saplings have come up naturally. And uh, at the behind, you can see another tire, which is the old tire. So this is how it actually happens. Now you go inside, which is very difficult. I'm showing you this, all of them, it has been recorded by Choyon, my PhD student. You see, sir has already told you the pneumatophores students. I think you can see the pneumatophores. They're all right up in the air, totally negatively geotropic, you can see. And the natural seedlings, natural regenerated seedlings, they're also coming up. This is the inside. I'm showing you much other videos also. See, this is another one. See how intricate it is. It's very dense. And the new metaphors are uh, always they actually hinder our progress. You cannot move inside the network of pneumatophores and all these things. They will always not allow us to move inside. So you see, this is a closer view of the still root of rhizophora. Rhizophora is not very frequently observed in the in the settlement, the fringe areas where we go, you see the naturally regenerated seedlings, the seedlings are coming up. You can only uh, find these rhizophora uh, in pristine areas, not in our fringe, uh, settlement fringe areas. You, can, you cannot find much near the settlement regions. In settlement regions, you mostly find Avicennia, Exicaria, Bruguera, Cereops, all these things, but not Rhizophora. This is the insight. Even if, had you gone physically also, perhaps you wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to enter it because it's so dense and it's very difficult to enter. Here you can see a spiny species. You can see the spines, you can see. This is Atlantia, Atlantia monophylla. This is one uh, mangrove associates. So this is also being rare. We hardly find it there. This is the inside of mangrove forest, pristine mangrove forest. This, you see, this is very, uh, it's muddy, muddy, sticky, hot, humid. All the types of adversities will, will welcome you there once you enter into this mangrove forest, but we love it. And I'm sure whenever, if you had the chance to go there physically, I am sure you will be later, you will be uh, going there. So you will be, it will be really a pleasant exp uh, experience for you people. See, numerous seedlings are coming up. If you don't disturb, they will come up on their own. You can see some of the plants, they have been 
this is natural distraction. They have been destroyed with the wind speed in Amphan years. We shortly uh, in 2020 and 21, both the years we have experienced right in the May season, we have experienced two uh, successive cyclones. So therefore you can see some part of the forest is destroyed naturally. This is naturally destroyed forest due to the climate emergencies. And this is a closer view of this mangrove dead palm forest. You see, this is Phoenix paludosa. It's a near threatened line. Uh, in Sundarbans, only in pristine areas, you can see them, not in settlement areas. These compound leaves, they are actually palm leaves. Now I am taking you to some of the <laughs> animate members. Uh, these are mobile members, you can say. Plants are also animate objects, but they are <laughs> sessile. They are not moving. So I am showing you some moving objects. Okay. These are the crocodiles. Crocodiles of Sundarbans. This video was taken by Choyon. Now we start, uh, I'm showing you some of the birds. The black ones, I think they, uh, they must be cormorate or something. I'm not a, a geologist. I don't know much about the animal names and in Bengali, we call it Pankori, I think. So it's Kormoret or something. I'm not sure. During winter season, you can easily find, even in summer also you can find. This is the only uh, videography of birds I, I'll, I'm showing you. Others are only will be still pic pictures. Okay, now I am coming to the invertebrate fauna. These are fiddler crab. crab. These are red crab, fiddler crab. You, uh, they are very dominant in uh, Sundaban, uh, these smart flats. You can find them, they are moving. I'm fast forwarding it because they will take too much of time. It is very common in Sundabans. You can find them easily. Then I think the geology student, they can easily find it out. What is it? What is it? This is a hermit crab. This is a crab, but the shell is a mollusk shell. So what they do, they take the refuge in these mollusk shell. Their uh, ventral soft part, it is protected like this. So initially when my student uh, Choyon, he took the photo, uh, these videos, I was really surprised what, what are these, uh, these snails are moving and these are crabs, under snail covered, snail uh, structure under crab. I, I, I am not from geology, so I was not aware about that. Then I came to know these are hermit crab. So they are like this, they move like this. They, use any of the abundant shells of the man, uh, this marine fauna, this molasses that they use. This is another, another molasses, you see? You can understand how much patience you 
you need to photograph all, all these things, this videograph all these things. It has been done entirely by Choyon. You can understand how much, <laughs> how much patience it requires to videograph all these things. People from geology, from marine background, they can identify this organism. I am not very much sure about its identity. This one again, another hermit crab. See, these hermit crabs are cute, really. Their colors are different. Their cho choice of shells are different. They are really cute things. You can see how speed uh, they are moving, how speedily. <laughs> they take these uh, abundant uh, mullas shells at their protective shelter. It's really fascinating. And now this is, you see, this crab is climbing the trees. This is tree climbing crab. Initially, when Choyon first showed me this video, I was, I, I couldn't identify what is it? What is it? <laughs> I kept searching in the internet. Uh, internet. Then I came to know this is a tree climbing uh, crab. It is actually very small. the tidal surges which is coming up. John has kept the background as same. This is another mullas, very common. I think it's Nerita or something. Very common mullas. See how difficult to photograph uh, this uh, video record, these things, but John has done it. We are not professional. But still, I think it is understandable for you people. This is standing in tidal water. He had to take this, he had to take this video. So you can understand how much pain he has to, he had to take. This one is another mullas. Very common there, very common. This one is the most common mollusk, telescopium. This is the telescopium. You can see most of the mud flats are they always uh, we can find the shells of this telescopium it's very common there see how it is moving I'm just fast forwarding it, otherwise I cannot finish. You also will feel bored. Then another video, you see, you have learned in ecology, the prey predator relationship, here you can see how this snake, it is just hunting its prey. 
it has caught a fish. This is also video recorded by Choyon. See how it is holding it. Very pathetic for the fish. <laughs> but the snake also has to survive, no? See the snake of Sundaban. You can see the niche, see the habitat, where it is there. This is Sundabans. Oh, another new shell occupied by. This is a special type of hermit crab. You see, it is yellow striped. It is a thin yellow striped hermit crab. It is also using another type of shell. They're so cute. I'm just fast forwarding. Now you see another very cute organisms there. These are mud scrapers, mud skippers. You see how they are playing. In Sundarbans, they are very dominant. You can find them. See, this is a gang of four or five and how they are playing happily in the mud flats. If you go to Sundarbans, you can see many colorful species of them, mud skippers. I'm just fast forwarding it. See, another one is coming. One, two, there are one, two, three, four. Now another has joined. So there are five. So they love to be in groups. Now the special attraction, the crab. These are the mud crab. These uh, actually uh, give the livelihood for Sundarban people. These are the mud crabs. The crab hunters, they search in the mud flat for this crab. This is a big size crab. After catching, how does it look? This is one of the crab hunters harvest, you see. <clears throat> After harvesting, it looks like this. This is their, the whole day's harvest and now they are going to sell it. These are the mud crabs. So Sundarban is well known for this crab species. And this is a crab hunter, which my students have come across and they made this video of crab hunting. See how do they hunt the crabs there in the mud flat. See, so he is successful. And then another uh, popular, uh, there another popular uh, livelihood uh, for the native Sundarban people that is fishing. That's fishing. You see, they use different types of uh, tools. These are all native tools they use. These are not very modernized tools, but they use. These are all small scale fishermen. And uh, this is another popular, uh, um, uh, this is popular livelihood there. They search for the prawn, uh, this, what I say, this, the prawn fry. Sundarban is well known for its, uh, the, 
all the sundarban rivers they harbor very good uh, they are the source of good prawn species this is pinias monodon and the prawn this prawn fries they are always they uh, at a particular season they hatch they uh, they come out of the uh, the eggs and they are they are hatched and these small fries they are being collected by a group of people it's a very popular livelihood there you see they uh, collect it in this way they pull a type of special net i don't know and at the end of the net there is a another container there they uh, covered the container with that net and they collect this water and after that it's a very laborious process the whole family gets engaged into it and this is how they select the prawn larvae and then they sell them uh, to the i think the fish farming people or something whoever is uh, involved in a large scale uh, farm fish farms or whatever so there they sell it so this is another popular livelihood in sundarbans apart from uh, selling their catch see here he is selling his catch these are the sundarban prawns they are not lobsters they are prawns this pinidon there are several other fishes also it's coming in their catch it's variety of native fishes you can find in sundarban rivers and variety of different types of crabs also and other members are this jellyfish i don't know what is this one but we we happen to see this one once and this is uh, you see you just see the ear we we happen to visit this a particular member in 2016 but that time i never knew what is that but very recently i came to know this is horse shoe crab and uh, people the specialist the researchers say they appeared in the in our evolutionary scale at the time of uh, this dinosaurs and dinosaurs are extinct but they are here still there so they are termed as living fossil and they are still maintaining all the evolutionary characters and it's very interesting for them and uh, professor punya slok bhaduri and his team at izar kolkata uh, they know that this species is being extinct and it's coming at bycatch for most of the uh, fish farming people so they rescue them they have they are training the uh, fishermen so that they can uh, rescue these uh, crabs and they send it to their labs and they uh, uh, give them proper medications proper uh, respiration and then again they uh, leave these catches these by catches this horseshoe crab again into the river and they are now planning to uh, put a, you know the the way we track several species olive ridley turtles and all these things they are trying to uh, devise they are utilize a device to track this uh, horseshoe crabs which they will be releasing in the water again in their native habitat so they are planning that with the forest department and that's a very good venture i think so hope they will be successful in this and this uh, this in 2016 we had a, 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 a we, we were uh, lucky to get this kind of picture this is the underneath of the boat we found this diverse catches in the same uh, catch these are the diverse species which have come out just from the sundarban river and now i come to sh uh, show you some of the uh, birds of sundarbans uh, i actually i tried to show you more of the birds pictures but i couldn't do it because uh, it was not saving the file is so large so some of them i am showing you these are all taken by my student hemen see how cute we had more pictures but i couldn't uh, get it saved here see and this is the pugmuk <laughs> i couldn't show you the royal bengal tiger but this is the pugmuk this photograph has been taken by him in 
So we are lucky to see this pagma in this January. And I have already told you that Sundarban is a good resource of honey, wild honey. So the main flower from who is uh, the nectar of which flower the honeybees they produce this honey. The main plant is this Agicerus, Agicerus corniculatum. This is locally it's known as Hol Holshe. It's they call it Holshe, and this is a very it has a very sweet scented flower. Uh, now is the time of its flowering. So you can, if you go to Sundarbans, you can find this, this plant is in full bloom. And I'm showing you just a small video. These are the honeybees and they are feeding on the nectar of this flower. And then after that, <laughs> they will preserve it in their hives. So this Agicerus is the main flower whose nectar is really uh, preferred by these honeybees. Honeybees are generally gener generalist. They're, this is the generalist pollinator. They pollinate several of the plant species flower. But here particularly this Agicerus is well known for this honey producing flower. And this is another uh, plant species. You can see this is another pollinator. This is yellow wasp. This is also a good pollinator. It's a generalist pollinator. It's pollinating the Bruguera gymnoriza flower. It's a very common flower there and it is pollinating it. So they are not producing uh, honey bee, honey beehive, but still they are helping in pollination. Okay, now I come to the last part. So now at this present moment, this ecosystem is, uh, sir already told you that it's really fragile and threatened at this point of time. And what is the cause? What are the causes? They are basically anthropogenic causes, and also during this climate change era, all the uh, natural hazards, it has jeopardized the existence of this unique ecosystem. Natural hazards like salinity rise, the frequency of cyclones, all these things, flooding, high tidal surges, erosion, all these things, they are compounded with the anthropogenic stressors and it has made this whole ecosystem uh, to be very fragile and threatened. Uh, the major part of it is protected by our forest department. It's, uh, uh, thank we are thankful for that. But rest of the parts, which is the actually the settlement region, that part is actually under grave danger. So our work is actually at this settlement region. So what we are doing, we are trying to do some restoration work. You know that uh, UNGA, the United Nations General Assembly, it has proclaimed this 2021 to 2030 as a decade on ecosystem restoration. And its theme is preventing, halting, and reversing the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. And what is the ecosystem restoration? Popularly, it's being done across the world, including India. People actually, they mean uh, by restoration, they mean that large scale plantation with one or two species, which are best locally available species, the propagules of the species, which are best locally available. So with that, uh, people do large scale planting and commonly they call it restoration. So this is what it's known as restoration and it's not in India. It's widely uh, in the whole world knows it in the name of mangrove restoration. So what are the propagules they usually use? This is rhizophora. This rhizophora has two species, mucronata and epiculata. And these propagules are widely used across the world for mangrove restoration. Okay, the single species this is the most dominant species, species which is being used. Uh, but in Indian Sundarbans, these rhizophora is actually available only in school areas. So it's, uh, it's less, we can say it's 
uh, it's less locally available. So the most locally available propagule is this Bruguera gingerizer. So in India Sundarbans, most of the plantations are being done by these propagules, Bruguera gingerizer. And along with that, people use some of the Sonaracea propagules also, Sonaracea casualis. You can see its flowers. And the Sonaracea apetala, they use these two species also. And they use three species of this Avicennia. These are the Avicennia propagules. These are also very easily available in Sundarbans. And also these two cereals, but this one is near threatened line. Also, it, it is globally near threatened, but in Sundarbans, they are still available in large numbers. So people uh, do the large scale plantations with this uh, propagule, this city of Dekandra and city of Stereol. So these are the most common species with which usually people do mangrove restoration, which they call it. But and our, uh, based on that principle, our uh, government, our West Bengal government, they have also initiated one, uh, very commendable job. They have covered already uh, almost 5,000 hectares of plantations of mangroves uh, during the year 2020 to 2021. All the uh, government departments, majorly forest department and uh, it's uh, under uh, uh, other administrative departments, they all together, they have done this commendable job. So, but how it looks, I'm just showing you this we basically call them monotypic plantation that is plantation large scale plantation with a one or two species so this is a monotypic plantation of Bruguera gingerizer so this is already 18 years old 18 to 20 years old monotypic plantation in indian sundarbans you can see all the plants they look alike all the plants they are looking alike so they this is monotypic plantation, you can call, they call it restoration. I'm not calling it, they're calling it. Okay, it's, uh, commonly it's known. Okay. I have shown you already the pristine forest and you can easily find the difference with this type of plantation and the pristine forest. When you go inside this plantation, Whatever I have shown you earlier, that is from the boat. When you go uh, from the to the uh, through the river from the boat, you will get that glimpse. And now you have entered. You have entered the monotypic plantation. Can you see the difference? Earlier I have shown you the pristine mangrove forest, and this is the floor of monotypic Dugaida gymnoriza forest. Here, actually, what we understand by restoration is the bringing back of the natural ecosystem, natural functional ecosystem, where the natural regeneration will be enhanced. But here I cannot find any such thing. I don't know whether it's Brugaria gymnoriza specific, but it is like this. You can see only you can find the pneumatophores. These are knee, knee type, knee roots. We call them knee roots. You can see the knee roots. Brugaria gymnoriza, they're having knee roots. These are also negatively geotropic. And as far as we can see, it's only like this, no natural regeneration of seedlings are coming up. So this is what we have seen in the monotypic plantation of Brugaria gymnoriza. Another monotypic plantation I'm showing you. This is the monotypic plantation of Cereops tagel. Siri of Stagel, you can see, this is another monotypic plantation. You see only a single species have been planted in large scale. And also you see the floor of this. This is a very old forest. It's almost 20 years, people say. Their local people say, but the growth is extremely stunted and they're not encouraging other natural uh, species to come there. I cannot find anything. You can also, can you find it? You also cannot find. Hardly some of the uh, other species are coming up in between them naturally, but most of the floor is bare. You can't see much. Natural forest formation is not taking place by this monotypic plantation. So I call them monotypic plantations. I don't call them mangrove restoration. If you are, you agree with me or not, but I don't call them mangrove restoration, but whatever. They are still, this is a good attempt to make our planet green, but not all greens are ecologically sound. 
So against this, what we are doing? We are trying to do some ecological restoration. What is it? This ecological restoration means we are trying to bring it back, the natural ecosystem, with the native diversity of the forest. Okay. And here the, you know, the secondary succession always take, takes place. You have seen in the uh, pristine forest also the secondary succession is occurring, but it takes longer time. So if you leave it as such, secondary succession will automatically take place, but uh, it might be hindered, but it will take a long time. So what we are doing, this is human assisted succession, what we'll be doing, but the time span will be reduced within four to five years. We expect that natural functioning of the degraded forest will be again coming back. So this is our objective. And with that objective, we started our work. And this is also large scale plantation, but this is uh, following the native diversity of the natural forest. And our final goal is to recover the natural functioning, the self-sustaining property of the forest and all the biogeochemical cycles, the natural functioning of all the bio uh, biogeochemical cycles, everything. So that is what our goal and uh, which will be later uh, being able to support the human livelihoods. That is also another important issue. So we are targeting that, but how much will be successful, we don't know. Uh, initially, we started with a small model uh, biodegraded plot. This is around three hectares and the support came from Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Actually, their initiative, they have given a theme call and against which we applied. So we initiated our restoration work in 2013 and 14 in a small patch. Now we are extending it. Okay, uh, we have seen that it is being successful. So we are extending it into another uh, scaling up this restoration. But you know, it's when you are doing in thousands of hectares, it, it's not possible because at a singular place, you cannot find the multiple number of species together. It's not possible. And for that, you have to make long, long travels and that needs a lot of money. So it's not possible. So still it is at the experimentation uh, scale only. Uh, but I hope that uh, government has money and at the time uh, passes on and uh, this reproducibility of this uh, te technology is well prove, proven, then uh, they, will, uh, they are going to accept it. They are going to accept ecological restoration as the normal restoration protocol, I think, over the years. So I'm now going to show you how was the site when we started. I have earlier also shown you uh, when we, sorry. When we, we were not blessed at this particular site, now the sites where we are working, we are much blessed there. They are already stabilized with grass system. But uh, this pioneer species was not at all present at the site when we started our work. You can see it was bare, totally bare, okay? It was totally bare due to some anthropogenic re re uh, reason. It was totally bare. And we started with our pioneer species, the halophytic grass species. We started uh, a large scale plantation of this species. This is a video from 2000. Uh, at the end of 2013, we started. So it was taken, I think, in 2014. At the beginning of 2014, this video was taken. So you see uh, this area was totally bare that time. And there are some plant species, but it was mainly one or two species, mostly Avicennia were there and Exicaria were there. And it was uh, barely nothing, no grasses, no pioneer species, nothing was there. Huh. You can say that if it is left as such, there would have been secondary succession, but our objective was to give it a bit assistance so that it can recover within a four to five years span. So now I'm showing you whether we have been successful in that or not. There are some a very few species. This is mainly Exicaria. This is, you can see the exposed to, and the site was very much erosion prone also very much erosion prone. So this is a video from 2014. And now you see how is the site. This is the drone image. 
it was taken at the beginning of 2020. So this is the condition of the site right now. This is the top view. I'll show you several images. This is the top view. These, all these videography were done during our workshop, recently ended workshop that was also funded by DBT. This was totally field-based workshop. See, we actually had to make a trail to walk through it for the workshop participants because now it has become so dense that it is very difficult for us to enter. Uh, I never thought that it would be so difficult. Now, see, we had to uh, make a trail to make our participants to move through it, this site. I'm fast forwarding it. It's a big video footage. The small nursery is still existing there. Initially, it was a big nursery. Now, most of the plants are planted there. This is the place where my uh, field staff, they uh, put their uh, uh, propagules, all these things, the storage, they store it there. So, I'm fast forwarding it. The site was totally bare at that time. I'm showing you why it was like that. You see, this is a site which is that time at 2014, it was a site which was just in front of a newly constructed embankment. You can see this was the embankment and it was newly constructed at that time, 2014. So the site in front of it, it was damaged. Okay, it was uh, most of the mangroves were lost from that site. So this is how we have done. We this is the embankment. You see, this is the concrete embankment. That time it was just newly constructed. And all the site in front of this embankment, it was totally bare at that time. So we chose this site as a model degraded plot and we started our work there. So this is the condition of this site right now. You can see from the embankment, the view is, has been taken. And you see here, our participants are moving through. This is the river. This is Barchura Midangohanga River, we call it. It's a confluence of Barchura and Midangohanga. And how it is from the inside, from the closer view. So this has been taken by Choyon, you see. It is a multi-species assemblage, which we are trying to develop there. I have shown you the pristine forest. Now you compare it with our developed site right now. You just compare. I don't have to tell you anything, whether we have been a bit successful or not, you see. I have shown you the monotypic plantation also. You just find the difference. We started with grasses. Now you can you have to find out the grasses where are they? But grasses are there. The grasses have allowed the initial. Uh, we have uh, assisted the plantation. We have initiated, but the grasses have entrapped more and more propagules. And now you see the naturally these propagules are coming naturally. These are coming up naturally, and they are filling up our sites. We stopped our plantation since two thousand eighteen. And after that, this, we just have given some protection with the local people, with the help of the uh, local <coughs> village administration. We gave it protection and just, you see, 
it is developing itself. So if you just assist the nature a bit and keep it undisturbed, it will come up on its own to the original state. That is what is our mandate. That is the mandate of ecological restoration, which we wanted to do. So how much we have been successful, you people will be saying that. This is also another part of the site. You see, uh, from the different morphology of leaves, you can find out that is a, it is a, uh, we are trying to bring back the native diversity of Sundarbans here. We couldn't, uh, so far we are harboring here around 30 species, but not at equal frequency. The composition is uh, not, uh, their abundance is not same. We introduce them, but you know, there are ecological preferences. The nature also has its own course. It will choose which uh, species will maintain which type of abundance. It's up to the nature only. So this is how it's growing up right now. I'm showing another video of this and then I think you people are feeling very bored. So this is another part. I'll fast forward it. You just see the ground flora. The seedlings are coming up. It has become the, the ecosystem, the degraded ecosystem, which was earlier there. It has started to be functional. I'm fast forwarding it. You see the number of propagules coming up. The natural regeneration is taking place. Some of the plants are very, they have grown up. These are Avicennia species, Sonoratia species, which have very high growth there. You see abundant number, innumerable numbers of seedlings are coming up of different species. Not only only Avicennia or only uh, Exicaria, not like that. There are several species. We are measuring all the quantitative data we are maintaining for this site. But this is a small area. So uh, based on this success, Department of Biotechnology, they uh, gave us another chance to scale up this restoration process. Now we are trying to develop it for some other areas also. So this scaling up is being done all through the funds of Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. So I'm showing you a site. This is a site. So how we choose, this is the site. You see, this is uh, this site. If we walk this site, we are already blessed because this site is already stabilized by grass species, naturally occurring grass species. These are mostly either they are uh, Potrasia or Sporobolus. They are coming up here. And you see this site was once, it had <laughs> a mangrove species, but it has been cut out. So it has been cleared. It's a mangrove cleared zone. So this is an, this is a site where we start working. This type of, this is the type of sites which we choose and we start working at this level. This size, you will be uh, asking me, what are the species growing there? You can uh, find basically Sesuvium or Suida. These are uh, the signature species in these kind of degraded uh, sites. You can find them very easily. And sometimes you are blessed if these sites are invaded by already pioneer grass species. So in our earlier uh, uh, site, we are not that much blessed. It was totally naked. Now I'm just showing you one site where we have started our work. This is a site. There's a drone image. You can see this is the river. This is the mud flat. And this is the site. This is a totally... Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think once upon a time there were mangrove, but this is the mangrove cleared area. So we 
have chosen this site to work on. We have started working here uh, since 2020. After the cyclone, we have started our work. This is the drone footage during our uh, uh, this workshop, recently uh, finished workshop. Uh, this is uh, here we are maintaining another nursery. You see the participants are moving through this. So how easily they are moving here because it's totally uh, unplanted. So they're moving. We have started plantations there, I'm showing you. So this is kind of sites and just beside it, you see this is the, behind it is the settlement zone. So the mangroves have been vanished, which are supposed to protect this settlement zone, but we are in a process to bring those mangroves back. So this is the site. You see our participants are moving through this site. We are blessed that this site already had some amount of vegetation. When there is already some amount of vegetation is existing, it is always helpful. It is always helpful to bring it back to the uh, original uh, state. I think hopefully within three, four years, we can make this site again in that we can give it, we can bring it to its original position, but uh, not with our earlier site. It was not so easy for that, uh, for us. It was very difficult, very challenging for us. Here you can see the small, small seedlings are coming up. We have planted, we have done our plantations here. We started since 2000, 2020. Here also we have done a lot of grass transplantation to stabilize the site. There were some grasses, but we have also worked a lot on this. This is the closer view. These are the potratia among which these grasses among which the we have planted our seedlings. So I'm just fast forwarding it, you can see. And these are the photographs, uh, these are the glass, grass plantations there in that site. You see, this is Myrostachia vidiana. This grass is also, it's, uh, it's around the, it's uh, just, the, both sides of the creeks in Pristan region, you can see these grasses. We have brought it from there and we have transplanted it. So how much work we have done to transplant these grasses. Don't think that one day you plant it and it will grow. It's not uh, so easy. Several times we failed, we again transplanted. So our field staff, they are always, <laughs> they are stuck to these kind of things. So, we had to do a very hard work bringing these grass species here. Some were there and already, and some we have brought. So this is how we start our work. And what is the advantage of these grass species is, these grass species will allow, will transplant some of the propagules, but these grass species will allow more of other propagules to come and it will get trapped in this grass species and they will come naturally growing. So it, our process will, our, it, it, it is actually an added advantage for us. So grass is a pioneer species. Not only that, it will help in colonization of the mangroves. It will assist the mangrove restoration, ecological restoration of mangroves uh, in a large extent. So, okay, I'm just fast forwarding it. You see. This international, uh, this news agency, Bonga Bay, when they came, they were really fascinated by this kind of grass plantation here. So hope uh, these grasses being there, it will very easily, uh, it will, uh, come into uh, the natural phase very soon. You see how many 
uh, propagules, how many uh, seedlings they got trapped, they're coming up, being trapped in the grass. This is how we take the counts. We take the uh, data, quantitative data on natural regeneration. This is how they get trapped. And uh, these are the R planted species there. So this is another uh, site where also we have started our work. Here also we initially transplant it with grasses. This is basically sporobolus, you can see. Within sporobolus, these other species are coming up. These are all trapped propagules. All them, I ha we have not planted it, but we planted the grasses and the other propagules also, but rest of the propagules, they're coming on their own and they get trapped in these grasses and they are forming the natural habitat of mangroves. So they are hastening the process of natural regeneration. And I have shown you, this is the natural forest inside the natural forest. And you see seedlings are coming up here and there in the network of integrate, uh, this integrated, what I say, this uh, integrate root system of mangroves. And now I'm showing you the nurseries. This is another part of our component of our restoration. This is the maintaining of nurseries. So we have to maintain two types of nurseries. These are freshwater, the plants which are uh, freshwater loving. This is, you see, this is the uh, mangrove dead palm. We are raising them here. These are Phoenix Pellucidosa. This is a near threatened line. Then also Sundari, you can find here the Heritiera is also. I'm just fast forwarding it. You can find where is Heritiera, this one. This is Heritiera bed. This Heritiera is we are also maintaining here. So these uh, nursery have to be uh, maintained by fresh water only. So at the initial juvenile stages, this is another and uh, near threatened line. This is brown loya tersa. This week, uh, commonly it's known as Lata Shundori. We are raising this bed also. So this is again Sundari because uh, they cannot tolerate high, at their initial phase, they cannot tolerate the high salinity. So they have to be raised with fresh water. So you see several freshwater loving mango species, we raise them in this type of nursery. This is another one. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, they call it, what is that? Lumnitzera, Lumnitzera decimosa. This is another species, Lumnitzera decimosa. This is also mangrove species, but at initial level, it cannot tolerate salt. So we maintain them in this type of nursery. And this is the nursery, which is uh, for high salinity loving plants. This is the nursery. I'm fast forwarding it and see. These are the several other plants in the nursery. We do uh, both the direct propagule uh, transplantation and also we, uh, uh, we um, plant the saplings from our nursery also. So both ways we do. Our field staff are all financially supported by Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. So they work very well, very hard worker, very sincere people they are. And they are all native from Sundarbans only. So they have been born and brought up at Sundarbans. So they work in that way. I'm just fast forwarding it. It's the same nursery. You see how much uh, work we have to do in the field. We do our work in the lab also. Simultaneously, we maintain our field and lab work. So 
so and uh, this is one condition i'm showing you this is the when we transplant direct propagules this is type of this is a respiration where we have propagules means direct seeds or propagules we have uh, just uh, put them there and they are coming out this is direct transplantation you call we call it direct transplantation rather than from the nursery we are uh, putting it directly uh, after collecting the seeds or propagules we are putting them here so this is an example how we do it in one of our sites we are doing it this is another site where we have done extensive grass transplantation you see extensive grass transplantation we have done and finally i am going to show you uh, a short film uh, which i made uh, with the funds of department of biotechnology government of india it was uh, shown in the international science festival uh, which was last year in december it was held in goa there it was shown by the department of biotechnology government of india i took their permission to show this one in our uh, international workshop also and uh, i hope they will not mind showing it to you because this is a dbt star college and i think you deserve to see this so this is a short film which will speaks on its own behalf
So I uh, this is the time for expression of my gratitude to my students and my collaborators. This is Choyun. All credit, most of the credits go to Choyun. He has very painstakingly with so great patience, he has taken all these videos which I have shown you here. And Choyun belongs to Sagar Island. He is a native person from Sundaban. So he has been born and brought up there. So he loves mangroves like anything. So he had been the right person to take all these videos during this COVID emergencies which restricted us in our home actually. But that time Choyan was busy at the fields and that the fruits of his visits you can see, I have shown you. And this is Hemen. Hemen is also a good photographer, but he didn't actually get much access to Sundarbans during this COVID emergencies. Actually, he stays in Calcutta. So still, he has tried his best to take part. And he is still continuing. Hope in the coming days, he will also give us good videos and good photographs. And these are my field warrior. You can see some of the videos are taken by them also. Not all have been uh, by chance only. So they are very, uh, they are all belonging to Sundarbans, they stay there and they work very hard, they are very sincere and they, uh, the <laughs> best part is they all uh, tolerate my tantrums, okay, I'm a very strict person, always shout at people, so, and these are my, all my students, present students who are involved in some way or other, they are all working on Sundarbans. And my major collaborator is my husband, Dr. Sandeep Kumar Basak. He is the principal of South Centenary College, Dhaniakali Hujli. And also my great collaborator is Sundarban Biosphere Reserve Joint Director. He represents our forest department. And uh, forest department, they have extended their very uh, kind collaborative hands. So therefore I can take this work forward and above all, my university, they are with me. All They extend all kind of supports. Without their, uh, uh, their uh, support, I couldn't have organized a <laughs> workshop, international workshop, uh, totally funded workshop, uh, having per participants all across India within uh, just uh, 10 to 15 days notice. It would not have been possible without my university's uh, great help and support. And also at the time of second uh, COVID emergency, it was just in the time of uh, second COVID, which was very, uh, very, uh, the Omicron insurgency, which was very uh, dangerous. And lastly, not the least, my funder, Department of Biotechnology Government of India. Since 2013, they have extended their generous support, financial support, all kinds of advisory, all kinds of supports for this work. I'm always after the live, and they accept all my conditions and they help me. So my great salute to Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and thank you. So I have taken too much of your time, almost two hours, I think so. So, Preeti, with your... It was a wonderful uh, session, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, I stopped... We enjoyed a lot. Uh, I stopped sharing. Should I? Thank you, ma'am. Jim. Yeah. How to Thank start? you, ma'am, for this wonderful presentation. We all were in awe of the slides and really enjoyed this virtual tour. Thank you for taking out time from your busy schedule and we appreciate all the efforts you and your heart and your team had put to restore the mangroves in the Sundarban Delta. Now with your due permission, ma'am, 
May we take few questions from the chat box? Of course. To start. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So the first question is: What's the difference between the mangroves of India and the mangroves of Bangladesh? Any peculiar difference? I don't think there is much difference. This is a continued stretch. Only the abundance, the way the Sundari is here, it's being uh, vanished almost. But Bangladesh still has few pockets of Sundari. Whatever I haven't gone to Bangladesh, but people, uh, scientists say that still it's there. So they <laughs> hope one day we can revive again our Sundari population here. Sure. Okay, next question is, are there any policies directed at protection and conservation of mangroves in India? Of course, that's why the Sundarban Biosphere Reserve is there, the Tiger, the, uh, Tiger Reserve is there, National Park is there. These are all the core areas and only because of our uh, constant watch, constant vigilance and the policies of our forest department, we can save our Sundarban mangroves. Most of the the major part is protected. So that is uh, one good thing for us. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is, what is better to conserve existing mangroves or to restore the degraded ones? You restore it when you have already destroyed it, no? <laughs> so both are important. You conserve, you don't destroy, and you stop destroying and you restore. Both are equally important. <laughs> then only we can restore the mangroves actually. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is, is there any toxic flora in the Sundarban? Toxic flora in the sense? Uh, ma'am, maybe the participant wants to ask that uh, any, any flora which is harming the Sundarban deltas may be due to it's upon the participant. I, I haven't know. come across any uh, reports like that, but maybe I have been working since end of 2013. So, and uh, my uh, area of visit is mainly restricted to the Western part. So maybe I am ignorant. So I do not know anyone, any mangrove to be toxic. <laughs> so ma'am, how are mangroves beneficial for the humans? Oh, everybody knows, no, it's, uh, I, your uh, <laughs> Professor Gupta has already elaborated that, that they, basically they are saving us, no, they are saving the coastal region, they are safeguarding, so all the cyclones, which are uh, repeatedly, which they're, uh, with the frequencies of which it has been uh, already declared to be enhanced by IPCC, Report. So that will be uh, safeguarded by the mangroves basically. And then they are huge carbon sequestration. They are responsible for huge carbon sequestration, both their below ground part and above ground part. So major, these two are major contribution by them. So they suck out all the <laughs> global energy, uh, global warming causing gases, mostly the CO2s, they all suck out. So they purify our air and save us from the obvious effect of climate change. So salute to mangroves always. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is, how was it difficult for you and your PhD students to work in such difficult landscapes? It is difficult, but it is enjoyable. And you know, the most uh, wanted thing is money, the funds. When you have funds, then you can work. And my students are also very hardworking, very sincere, and they follow all my guidelines. They endure all my tantrums also. So we can do jointly. I, I am basically pretty knows. I was never a field person. We used to work on transgenic species sitting at the labs. This was basically of my husband's idea who worked with Professor Babu. So they are more aligned to ecological restoration. Their group, they knew. So we just uh, made a combined effort. He gave the field support, I gave the lab support. So together we did the job and DBT was with us and forest department was with us. My students was with us, so we could achieve. Yeah, we could see. Next is, why, mono, why monotypic plantation drives are carried out in Sundarbans? 
actually uh, you cannot afford to do this kind of multi species uh, forest generation uh, with the community people or all these things but still our government is trying to some extent but it's basically mono species uh, because uh, the most available propagule you have to use the most available propagules which will be easier you it won't cost much traveling cost much a uh, nursery cost and you can do it with the community people they have whatever they have achieved they have done with community people with the forest giving their training giving them training something like that they have done with government funds they have done so but ecological restoration is quite expensive at least at this stage for our common people to carry it out of course government can do it but it's up to them how they will be doing it but when you are uh, you require to do a large scale uh, something very large scale then obviously you will be depending on the most available easily available propagules no so it's not possible for you to and all the propagules are not available at the uh, same place so you have to travel long long and travel is very expensive whoever gone to sundarbans they know the travel is very 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 expensive so <laughs> that's the main restriction too so in large scale still this uh, monotypic plantation is still valid for large scale as mentioned but something is always better than doing nothing no i believe in that <laughs> thank you ma'am for answering the questions so patiently and widening a sea of wisdom from the knowledge of their rain, from the raindrops of the knowledge i would request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form for which the link will be floated in the chat box to avail your participation easier now i request priti ma'am to kindly pr propel the events of the program further thank you all the participants are requested to uh, fill the feedback form and link has been already posted in the chat box so thank you uh, very much dr ray for an enlightening and insightful presentation on the ecological restoration work done by you and your team in the indian sundarbans your years of hard work has finally paid off and today through this virtual tour we got an opportunity to visit the indian sundarbans and enjoy the beauty and diversity of flora and fauna of this beautiful mangrove ecosystem we also got a first hand experience of the ecological restoration work done by your team to protect this fragile ecosystem from degradation ma'am should i say something or <laughs> no, no. you want to say something then definitely you can ma'am i i don't want to say something i am too honored <laughs> this opportunity to share my experiences thank you all. so much ma'am it's it's a pleasure so as a senior colleague ma'am during you know in the lab during my phd days i learned a lot from you and ma'am your dedication and hard work is really commendable <laughs> once again i thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time from your busy schedule to be the invited speaker for today's event thank you ma'am Uh, ma'am we have a small token of appreciation for you in the form of an appreciation certificate and a memento please accept them with our sincere thanks of course i accept them <laughs> i would request ms taveri to display the certificate of appreciation and memento on the screen over to you taveri thank you Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Priti and your whole college team, college authority. They patiently readjusted the time for me. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. We are rather we are very thankful to you. Thank you, Kaveri. Uh, so at the end, uh, I would like to thank our uh, principal, Professor Rajiv Agrawal, Vice Principal, Professor Kamal Kumar Gupta, DBT Star College Team Coordinator, Dr. Indrakant K Singh. IQAC coordinator Dr. Aditya Saxena for their constant support and encouragement in organizing such student centric academic activities in the college. I thank our ever smiling and, and enthusiastic teacher in charge Dr. Aparna Nautiyal for her unconditional support in conduction of today's event. I'm extremely grateful to all the faculty members of Department of Botany for their constant support and encouragement. Without their support and cooperation this event would not have been possible. 
my sincere thanks are due to Dr. Monica Bajaj from Computer Science Department for all the technical support. I also thank all the student coordinator who work day in and day out in organizing this event. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants who took time out for attending today's event. Now I would request all the participants to kindly turn on their camera for a group photograph. Thank you, uh, one and all. Goodbye and have a nice day. Namaste to all of you. Thank you.